Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Marty. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Prince George Group in Hamilton. I don't think, uh, I mean, I, this is way too formal, right? Like, this is crazy. I had no idea what I was coming into. And I think, I think what I, it was really important is to, uh, hang on a second. I spilled coffee on my tie and everything already. <laughs> Hold on. I just got to loosen up a little bit. That's it. That's it. That's it. Okay. So, okay, so, huh? Yeah, Schwartzy. Um, so what we got, like, I asked, uh, I asked, uh, Chris and Dave up to Hamilton in the spring, um, Hamilton, Ontario, and, uh, they just did a bang up job, and I gotta tell you that, uh, I don't know if I told them yet, I shouldn't have them told Dave yet, but, uh, they've been talking about that presentation since. I've done many of them, and, uh, uh, it wasn't just what happened uh, uh, with the material that was delivered. It was the ambiance and the affectious uh, love for Alcoholics Anonymous that caught on. And it's hard sometimes for, for, if you're around here in the six, seven, eight year range, it's hard to understand how people can still have this passionate love affair with Alcoholics Anonymous because your ego and your mind is probably already telling you, is this all there is? Well, I'm going to tell you something. These guys demonstrate for me that there's a lot more to Alcoholics Anonymous than I ever dreamed possible. And it's for that reason that it's not, it's not hard for me to jump in a vehicle and, and make a trip, especially when I'm not driving and paying for it. And uh, <laughs> I want to thank Kevin so much for, uh, for, for making all of this happen. I got word in, in, uh, in the fall that, that this was going to be taking place, which is what I think is you know, plenty of notice. And uh, here's the flyer. So it says, Hammering Home the Principles. I mean, everybody in Hamilton would be laughing their ass off if they knew you guys had asked me to come down here to talk about spiritual principles. <laughs> but I didn't let you know that till I got here. So, but it goes on to say that I'm going to take you through the big book of three one-hour sessions. Now, I prepared an incredible, I mean, it was incredible talk today. I worked night and day, hours on end for months on this presentation. It was, there was AV, there was all kinds of charts, and it was, a, it was, it was spectacular. And then I met you all last night and thought, no, you're a lot sicker than that. So, <laughs> so at 1.30 in the morning, uh, Kevin and I put this thing together, and uh, my only hope is that you have as much fun sort of taking it up with me, not from me, taking it up with me as Kevin and I had doing it, because you can hear I've lost my voice again. It's because we couldn't stop laughing. And i got to tell you, Hey, we're, we're alcoholics, but we're not right, you know what I mean? Like, it, it doesn't matter if we're drinking or we're not drinking, and uh, we're just not right. And how could it be that I had since September? And, 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 and you know, I, I'm so nervous, and I told anybody that asked me today, asked me how I was doing, and, and, and I feel ashamed a little bit, i got to be honest, a little bit that I am so nervous, because, because I do believe in God. I believe in the power to put, you know, all of us into the place that we can... We can talk like this and communicate like this because this isn't my life. This is not my life, you know. And the other thing that I wish that had happened is if I, I just wish I had been telling you my story first. I mean, what I'm about to talk about in a few minutes might make a little bit more sense. Um, but, uh, you know, what we came up with, what I came up with, what, and then Kevin did all the work for, was uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to steal this from you, actually. Um, <laughs> is this here every week? Uh-huh. It, it, this is your placard. Yeah. And... We're talking about hammering home the principles, probably because of the play on Hamilton. Genius, man. The other choice was Clamato and Recovery. Clamato and Recovery, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I'll get to that. Um, I believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I, I really believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. And... When I saw the topic, that, that works. That works for Marty Cosgrove. That just works because um, I don't necessarily, I'm not known as a guy who fools around in AA. You know? I got like 19 recording devices here. I'm just going to shuffle them over here. Um, and I know, uh, did everybody bring their Living Sober book? I got mine. 
and 12. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you very quickly about 12 and 12. Because if anybody knows me and knows my story in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have a part in our book that says we have to find where other people are right. We have to look and see where other people have ideas and thoughts that might jive with our own. And I'm not anti-12 and 12. I just got sober. Let me rephrase that. I was just involved in my sobriety with the 12 and 12 for 14 years, having never taken a step or a direction in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I knew the 12 and 12 inside out. And if you're a Sandy Beach fan like I am, that's not a bad thing. It's not a terrible thing. There's a lot of good stuff in the 12 and 12. And if you do have your big book, what I want to do is turn your attention to page 174. That's the first thing I would like to do to get kicked off. Um, I missed anything? I'm sorry. Yeah, I asked, oh, see what I did is I got it all put together. It's not in your big book, sorry. <laughs> Anybody here got 12 and 12? <laughs> okay, I, want, I just want to read something to you, and I'll show you the pertinence. I'll show you how the relevance can, can sometimes be, uh, be helpful for us. This is new. This whole glasses thing. I uh, I was uh, in a, involved in a car accident in April, and uh, on April the 22nd, and uh, I hit my head. And um, just now, the sort of ramifications of that head injury are starting to show themselves. The um, um, visual cortex or something is still vibrating, so I can't see very well. But the, the thing where you're going to probably notice it the most is that I don't necessarily always close loops. So. Because there's no new guys in here, we won't worry about that. I'll expect you to be able to close the loops yourself. We're all of like mine. But I also said this to some people before I got up here, too. If you got something to say, or if you just want to say, Marty, that's a load of bullshit, don't leave. Say that and stay. And, and please, if you got something you want to say, just, just, just say it. You don't have to raise your hand. Just say it out loud. This is a nice small group. We can make this quaint. We're going to be together for the next couple hours. We can really do this nice, and then we're going to eat and... I'm really good at that, too. Um, okay, so what it says here is it says, on page 174 in Tradition 9 of the 12 and 12, it says, unless each member follows to the best of his ability our suggested 12 steps to recovery, he almost certainly signs his own death warrant. His drunkenness and dissolution are not penalties inflicted by people in authority. They result from his personal disobedience to spiritual principles. They result from his personal, his disobedience to spiritual principles. You know, we were talking about, when we were at the breakfast this morning, we were talking about direction we sometimes get from our sponsors. And, 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 and guys like me will, will sort of pounce on that stuff. And, you know, your sponsor's not to be involved in that. and you, you shouldn't be telling anybody what to do and all that kind of stuff. Well, who else is going to tell you? you know, and what it says here is it, it's, it tells me about how important obedience is. Obedience to spiritual principles. Now, when I get this, this title, I go online, I check out some resources, I understand, you know, if I was to ask for a list from GSO, they would send me a list of spiritual principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's on a little card, and it's a big book index. And nobody anywhere has ever written that these are the spiritual principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. What they say is, and this is another 12 of 12 quote from the forward, maybe my last one, it says, these steps embody spiritual principles that if practiced as a way of life can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. Does everybody know that? You ever know that piece from the 12 and 12? These steps embody spiritual principles. So what I'm talking about here from the 12 and 12 says we're really talking about spiritual principles in Alcoholics Anonymous, but we need to be obedient to them and we need to know that these steps embody those spiritual principles. And what are the principles? That's up to you to decide. There's many, there, Barefoot Bill has half a dozen of them on his site. He's from Jersey, right? Yeah. He's got half a dozen of them on his site. If you, if you were to send a GSO, they, again, they give you this little card. And I put in the inside of my book, honesty, faith, hope, dependence, courage, integrity, willingness, brotherly love, uh, willingness, humility, brotherly love, restitution, perseverance, communication with God, and charity. Those are the 12 principles that I was taught to practice in Alcoholics Anonymous when it says we practice these principles in all our affairs. I can grade my degree of living that at night in prayer using those earmarks. I can see the degree to which I'm living a life of, of spiritual principles using those earmarks. Does that make sense? So, and we can get in there and we can get into the nuances of that and we can argue that stuff, but it doesn't make any sense to argue, right? So it says that Marty will take you through the big book in three one-hour sessions. What we had come up with uh, to do that was the book makes two references throughout 
is the how and the why. He wants us to understand that Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and you guys have heard this before, but I'm going to say it again to somebody that maybe has In its inception, Alcoholics Anonymous was a 12-step spiritual program. That's, in its inception, it was a 12-step spiritual program, driven by the Oxford movement, driven by past experiences and understanding. It was a 12-step spiritual program with a supportive fellowship. Okay, so you have this 12-step spiritual program. Hmm. And then this supportive fellowship. And why would it be like that? But because there was three knuckleheads in Jersey getting sober, at the same time there was three guys in Hamilton, Ontario getting sober, and three guys in Washington getting sober, and three guys in Florida getting sober... We weren't getting together once a week. There were no meetings. You know, and if there was a meeting, there'd be a couple of guys there, and in between that meeting and the next meeting, I got your list. I stole one of your group lists. I don't know if you have to pay for it, but I stole it already, so <laughs> Does that cost money? No. Look at this, look at this, look at this. You guys got a few meetings you get to get to, eh? That's like all of Canada right there. I shit you not. And so there's a lot of fellowshipping going on. A lot of fellowshipping. You got fellowshipping for, for gay time guys. You got fellowshipping for women, for, for, for kids. You got mornings, afternoons, evenings. Lots of fellowshipping. Lots of fellowshipping. It's a 12-step spiritual program with a support of fellowship. Now... You fast forward to the year, I'm going to say 1987, because I can't speak about alcoholics now before that. What we have is we have a fellowship with an optional 12-step program. And this is where I'm preaching in the choir. Not everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous takes the steps. I know you're shocked, so hold on to your seats. I know you're shocked. And there are guys in this room that have gotten in a lot of trouble in Alcoholics Anonymous for pointing that out. And to you I say, keep pointing it out, just learn a nicer way to do it, you know. Um, because being unpopular in Alcoholics Anonymous isn't, isn't terrible. But it, I'm going to be open and honest here with you because in case this recording ever the best gets back to the fellowship in, in Hamilton. I need you. I, I, I need you to survive. And I, I have put myself in the peril of ostracization in the community I come from because I don't dick around. Because I hammer home the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I care more about whether you live than I do about how you feel. You come to Alcoholics Anonymous. You come to this 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 this, this program. And and we have on the walls and, and, and in our hearts and we have this 12-step program. And you'll stay here for four years and never... Take the program. I mean, that's insane. That's, that's, that's more crazy than taking the next drink, I think. How could you be 30 years in a 12-step program and have never taken the steps? How can you do that? And I don't care about the quality of life. I got guys in my group who I absolutely love, who, who probably live by spiritual principles of another experience. And because they're wonderful people. One of the guys that I'm talking about came and tugged on my, he's 34 years old, but tugged on my shirt about a few years ago, and he said, I think I'm one of those guys. He said, which guy? I never took the steps. This man has helped so many people in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's not funny. He's been there, he's paid their bills, he's gone to their place, he's gone to their weddings, he's a godfather, the 26 AA babies, he's, he's, the man's an amazing man. And I wish he was my dad. If I had to handpick a dad, it'd be this guy. But I don't know, I don't know why I have to do the things I have to do to get to where he has to be, where he is. He didn't have to do these things. So I spent a lot of time looking at people like that and pointing my finger. And I spent, and it wasn't healthy. It wasn't healthy. It got me a lot of speaking gigs. It got me involved in a lot of different areas of service. But it wasn't healthy inside. My heart and love and tolerance for people is our code. That, that can't change. I have to see fighting everyone and everybody. That can't change because... Because I'm really right, <laughs> you know, and they're all really wrong. I can't, can't change because of that, because I'm on the side of the right. It can't. It has to be that when I get the opportunity like this with you people, I saw many of at the meeting I was at last night. I hope she shows up today. Um, I have to be open and honest about my experience. So, and I'll talk about that later. So, and, and, you know, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing inside of me that, uh, um, is going to be, uh, I think new from a, from a, a knowledge perspective to anybody here. I just don't. 
the way we've broken it down is we're going to talk about trusting God, cleaning house, and helping others. And is there anybody in this room tonight, 30 days or less, 40 days, 60 days, 30 days or less? I need to ask you. I'm going to ask you straight. Hey, you were here setting up and everything, man. That's great stuff. Great stuff. Uh, are you offended or, or disturbed in any way in talking about God or the power? Does that trouble you in any, any way? Okay. Good. Beautiful. Because you know, I'm going to be talking to you guys. I said when we were coming in, is a lot of like-mindedness isn't always a good thing. You know, it's not always a good thing. When there's brand new people coming in or people coming in from detoxes and stuff and you're carrying a message like this, isn't it nice when they're there? Because who are you talking to after the meeting until 2 o'clock in the morning? You're not talking to the guy that just got everything confirmed. You know, you know there's people going to walk out of here at 7 o'clock tonight and say, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I think. And they're going to go home and they're going to watch that football game they, they, they taped today, the DVR, right? The new guy's going to go, holy shit. Or the new girl is going to go, there's a level of something here that is not what I thought. That's not what my therapist or the treatment center said. No, I don't know if I strike you as a Bible thumb. Do I? Um, but I am on fire for this. I'm on fire for, for, for God. I'm on fire for the power. So what I want to, in, in, sort of the way we, we looked at it is the how and the why of it. Trust God, clean house, help us. So anybody got any questions? Anybody got anything they'd like to throw in? You can totally deflect in, in the whole thing. Anybody? You guys got nothing to say? Shut I thought we had this all planned out. <laughs> um, I got a question. Do you want us to remove, uh, remove some of the Christ ones on the tables? Yeah. Well, they be, they're going to go flying at some point. Like, I'm trying my hardest to keep everything stable, but I get uh, I get sort of moving around and stuff. And, uh, I put my... Sure. <laughs> this has plenty of reach on it. Oh, yeah. Some of these things are fantastic. You can be in the back of a room this size and just point it. It's amazing. Okay. So, are you asking if we have any questions about how it works part right here? About that, or you can if you want to, if it's something you want to hear about, is there my take on something? By all means, or if you're struggling, if there's something you're struggling with, I want you to throw that out here because we got a treatment for it. Have you questioned the relevancy of what occurred in the 30s as it as relates to today? From Bill's, have you questioned the relevancy of what Bill went through and Dr. Silkworth found out and what the early alcoholics uh, experienced versus your life today and how has that affected uh, what you did? Anybody hear that? Anybody else understand it? <laughs> That's a great question, Dave. Uh, coming out of the gate. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, too. Anytime you say the word, the name Bill Wilson, I think of James Woods. And anytime you say, anytime you say the name Dr. Bob, I think of James Garner. I don't think they would be terribly offended by that. Uh, pretty tight cast. But um, When I talk tonight, and this is, where, this is where this comes in. When I talk tonight, you'll see that my Alcoholics Anonymous story is very relevant to the 30s. I don't have an Alcoholics Anonymous story of treatments, therapists. Although all those things were in my life, uh, I was 17 years old, and a psychiatrist said, do you have a drinking problem? And I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, you drink, you feel guilty, you drink. Yeah? No, that's, that's, that's your assessment. <laughs> well, this psychiatrist committed suicide about 10 years ago, but... Uh, and I don't mean that. It's just like it's like it's not unusual, right? But that's that's my therapy experience. Uh, the treatment centers, and most people are driven in here by some sort of uh, recovery tools, assessment tools, some sort of measure of therapy or treatment. Most people, not a lot of people, are making the call to AA and then getting here. Although there's probably some people in here that that's your that's your experience. That's not the norm anymore. And I think that that's the major difference is that. And I don't want to tip my hand, but some of these may not be here anyway, but I didn't ever come to AA. AA kept, AA kept coming to me. And I talked about it last night, you know, and, I, and, and I, you know, I'm going to get to, you know, page 20 at some point. Uh, at some point there. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon our constant thought of others and how we might help meet their needs. When a person is in trouble... They must go and find somebody to be of help. 
They don't need to call the therapist or call the, the sponsor or call. They need to find somebody they can help. That's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous that existed in the 30s. It's the message I get today. It's the message Bill experienced in the Mayflower Hotel. It's the message that he and Bob experienced together and that right after the talk. It's the experience that the third guy in the bed experienced as soon as he got the word was that, holy crap, I see how this works. When I'm not feeling right, go help somebody. That's not the message today. So the relevance today is, is, is very pertinent because it's how I, it's, I've been able to live my life like that. I don't necessarily frame it up from a, from a then and now. What I know is that when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous in 1987, I had never seen, I did not see a big book on the tables of the meetings that I was going to. It never was there. And people will call me on that in Hamilton and say, you just didn't see it. And I say, you're full of shit. And even if it was there, what was it doing? Propping something else up? Because nobody opened it, nobody read it, nobody talked about it. There were meetings at the area of social club where people would read the stories in the back and share their own personal wine drinking experiences relative to the story. But there was never anything, like the book just seemed dated. The book seemed really dated. And I'm going to just quickly talk about this. If you look on page 65, you know where it is, it doesn't matter. It, at the resentment piece, okay, so you're looking at the inventory. I looked at that way back in my early sobriety and said, how lame is that? How lame is that? That couldn't possibly be pertinent to a knucklehead like me. And when you find out the kinds of things that I was involved in, the kinds of things that, that, is, that isn't going to scratch the surface, not even touch it. And then there's this other piece in the back of text that moves it to text and talks about some other columns. It talks about some other work to be done in that four step. I never saw that there. Nobody pointed that out to me. I had a sponsor. I had, I went to meetings every single day for the first five years I was sober. Nobody pointed that out to me. So that's the relevance. There was no, you came to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1935, 36, 37, 38, 39. You came to the door because someone brought you to AA. And they took you into a room and they prayed on you. And then when you took the steps, you came into a meeting and shared what your experience was like. That's how it worked. Now, doors are wide open. People come in at any point and they can share whatever the hell they want because we don't want to offend them and drive them away. I don't know why we're on a membership drive here, but I really don't give a shit. <laughs> I really don't give a shit. We need to weed people out. Not, not, we don't need to be driving them in. We need to, if you're an alcoholic of our type, this shit works for you. And if you're not, you're going to hang around here long enough just to piss me off. <laughs> and then my work becomes ineffective because I become angry and upset and I get ineffective. I just, people stop hearing me. And they tell me that. Don't tell me to come up. I really liked your message, but I just, you know, really started throwing shit around and started kicking stuff. And I wasn't even going to do that today, but. I was really going to temper it today. Uh, just, just telling, that's why I said to Kevin, Kevin says, why don't you just lean this up here? It's because this podium is not going to be staying still. Um, anyway, so, I, I don't know if I touched on the question. I think, uh, I think the depiction, and the reason I talked about James Woods and James Garner was because I think the depiction that's displayed in that movie comes from the heart of an alcoholic. And I can't watch the scene of the communion between those two men without crying. And if you're an alcoholic of our type, I'm going to start crying now, man. If you're an alcoholic of my type, and you lived where the darkness and the dissolution and, and, and the pain, I can talk about the men who are dead now, who came and carried a message to me, because they needed to stay alive themselves. It was for no vain glory or anything. They're gone. They're, they're gone. You know, so, you know, and, and we'll, hopefully we'll, we'll get to that and help others. So we'll stop it. Um, no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Every second line, I have don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. My material my material is going to go fine. You're going to muck it up. Okay. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> What's your name? Hi, I'm Patty. Hi, Patty. Hey, Patty. So this is a great group of, of drunks to ask this question. Uh, I don't have a deal. Uh, you know, how passionate you guys all are about the post steps and resting in uh, uh, you know, all my channels up and, and looking for the true alcoholics and and, um, you know, I'm, I'm really learning more and more how to take one of these steps. So here's my question. When, the, when someone is moving and their life is out of the world, and their life's in wreckage, 
you know, I, there's a lot of stuff that possesses us. Like, should I sign a contract that my husband is making me sign that I sign up with the kids in the house and my hair is And so they ask us this stuff. And the cars in town did, what do they do with the car? And things that aren't necessarily, but they, but I can't say a sponsor, sole responsibility is to take them to step. Because they got all the stuff before. And they have nobody else to ask. So, well, you, do. you know, I have my sponsor who I trust and she's awesome and, and she's right there with me on the phone set call. But sometimes she's like me. That's what we're looking for. And together we're like, we're not sure. And so, you know, I'm sure as you guys are all wrestling and it's going to be a little as I know it can be. You know, what do we do with this? We all run into those people that are coming in here with a, a huge amount of debris behind them, um, uh, uh, crime and pain and, and bills and, and losing their homes and their families and children issues. A lot of women with, with child, uh, you know, child services issues. We are experts. We really are experts only in one one capacity, and that's alcoholism. Now, what happens is that we have to remember it's not just drinking. It's alcoholism. We, we have we have familiarity with the disease, and we have familiarity, hopefully, with the recovery process. That's what we can attend to. We can attend to that through the twelve steps. One of the magical things about getting somebody see behind, and we're going to talk. And when I get into the trust God piece, I mean, I don't know what you think of when you think of first things first. You know, me, I think of the other alcoholic, but very closely behind it, I think of God. And some days you're interchangeable. Some days. You know, the space between you and me is where God lives. So I need that alcoholic for God to be present, and I need God to be present when I'm with the other alcoholic. Have you guys ever, like, you, know, you hear when two alcoholics get together, God shows up? Have you ever golfed with an alcoholic? It's no fucking fun. It's dangerous. I mean, clubs are flying around, it's cursing, and, you know, you something, it's to be survived sometimes doing shit with other alcoholics. Bowling, they're cheating on the scores, you know, they're lying. But when two alcoholics get together for the purpose of recovery, I don't know, something enters a room. Something powerful enters a room. And we know what that's like because we can be strangers. And we can sit at a table across from one another and just start opening up. It's weird stuff. The rest of the world thinks we're freaks. They really do. Like, you can just start talking about, you know, 30 seconds we're talking about child services stuff. You know, my ex-husband and my new husband and the boyfriend. and you know, It's all coming out. Like, within 30 so we have this thing going on. It's it's a language of the heart, Bill referred to it. So these things aren't going to stay. We need to be clear of this stuff. Now, in answer to your question specifically, this process was never meant to be long and enduring. This process was meant to be fairly rapid and quick. The woman that you're talking about specifically needs to be pointed directly to the power. And if she can't, she says, I can't deal with the power right now. I have to deal with child support or child services. You say, child services is not going anywhere. But if you don't get this right, that won't matter. And it's always about taking the person back first things first. It's always about taking the person back to the work. The answers to whatever it is that's plaguing them or ailing them are in the steps. We're here talking about the 12 spiritual principles. We're not talking about Alcoholics Anonymous so you don't drink. We're talking about applying 12 spiritual principles to all aspects of our life. And then we do that through the reconciliation with somebody who has already been there. And not just the circumstances, but you've had painful circumstances in your life. Thank God you didn't allow them to come before your relationship with God. Or you wouldn't have a message to carry. If you let her put the circumstances of her life before God, she won't have a message to carry to the girl behind you. She'll always say to the girl behind her, you know what? You need to get that stuff all straightened out and then come back and see us. And she'll end up eating a piece. That's what I'll, she'll end up tying up or overdosing her. And that's how we die. That's how we lose people. And we don't lose them when they're drinking. We lose them in between drinks. We lose them when they can't live with it and they can't live without it. And they say, I don't want to live. I don't want to be around here anymore. Boom. And they're gone. And it looks a lot like all that calamity. But it's not. It's about not having a relationship with a power that could have delivered her to some, to some freedom and some peace. But we gotta believe that, we gotta believe that from our deep, the deepest part of our own need. You know? We have to believe that from the deepest part of our own desire and our own requirements. You know, we know, we, if you came to Alcoholics Anonymous and you're just like a little bit alcoholic, 
then you're going to recover really good on just a little bit of this stuff I'm talking about. <laughs> but if you were a pig, alcoholic, like if you were a low down gluttonous pig alcoholic, and I'm not just talking about drinking, I'm talking about for everything. You just need more of everything. More booze, more sex, more dope, more parties, more fun, more sleep, more whatever. You just need more. If you're that person, well, how does that stop when you come here? I'm going to get right to the comfortable spot and then stop. I'm as much a pig in alcohol anonymous as I ever was of, ever. And I just need more. And I need more and I drive to Jersey to get it. And I got it last night. I got it last night. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I already said I hope she shows up. There was a woman in your, in your midst last night who was on fire and she was beaming it. She didn't have anybody sitting beside her. She didn't have any reason to be smiling the way she was smiling. She didn't have any sort of, but there was something going on in her that I drove down from Hamilton to see. And it's a fire and a passion and a love for Alcoholics Anonymous and, and the alcoholics. And that's the stuff that I will continuously travel to find and to see and to be around. So that because she can carry a message of depth and weight to someone. I, somebody had said to me after, because I mentioned it, and they said, you should have seen her a couple years ago. <laughs> We're always really quick to tear people down. They don't, they don't know that's actually a... a that's actually a, com uh, a compliment. You know what I mean? You say you should have seen him a couple of years ago. That's a compliment. You're damn right it is. <laughs> I know. You should have seen him six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin and I were driving over here, and we he said, you still notice Anthony settled down a little bit? I said, yeah, I really like it. Kevin says, I don't. <laughs> I like when he's wild and crazy. Okay, so... I'm going to try, I'm going to run through this stuff at a fairly rapid pace. Um, and I just want you to stay with me, okay? And, and if you've got your book in front of you, great. If you don't, that's okay. So the first thing I want to turn to is XXVIII. I, I have no idea what number that is <laughs> at all. I'm Roman Catholic, but not Roman. <laughs> And I'll get a little quicker at this as we go. Like I say, this was 1.30 in the morning. Where is unless? Where is it? Where do you see the unless, Dave? Eh? Unless the first... At the bottom, at the bottom, the very bottom. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's not even the beginning of a sentence. That's why I couldn't find Okay, so it says, unless they can again experience the sense of ease from which... Uh, a sense of ease and comfort which comes by taking a drink okay that the, until they have an entire psychic change is the important piece so the phenomenon of craving develops and unless a person can experience an entire psychic change XXIX unless a person can have, experience an entire psychic change there is very little hope of his recovery so what we're talking about here we're talking we're going to talk about trust God but we're going to talk about the why first okay we're going to talk about the wives first. And I'm, I, my direction is just to take you through the book. You all got books. Hopefully, is that all highlighted in everybody's books? Anybody need a highlighter? <laughs> I didn't got any. I just asked. <laughs> okay. Now, if you've got a pen, underline that. I mean, that's an important piece. Unless an entire psychic change. It doesn't say partial psychic change. It talks about an entire psychic change. I want you to think about how you were thinking the day before you got sober. What were you thinking about the day before you got sober? And we're moving into something that isn't a partial change, it's an entire change. Can you see that page number again? It's XXIX. Uh, what's the starting paragraph? Go down to where it says, unless this person can experience an entire psychic change. Bottom of XXIII. No, uh, next page. XXIX. Hey, I confused you at first. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, is it, are they different page numbers in the third edition? Yeah. I think you got a Canadian book, right? <laughs> An accurate one, you mean. <laughs> uh, many of us have the second edition manuscripts. The second edition. Uh, second edition uh, oh, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> this is going to be really interesting. The first word in the, par in the, chat, in the paragraph. Okay, the first, par the first word in the paragraph, like, it's the sense of ease and comfort, which once in uh, my book is the top of the page. Is that the top of your page? The sense of ease and comfort? Yeah. On the to page XXIX? The beginning of the paragraph is made of women. Yeah. And the maroon book is XXVII. XXVII. 17. Of course it is. 
Right. I should move right into the first. The 164 pages aren't different, right? No, they're not. But these ones are going to be all over the place, right? Yes, they are. Okay. You know, I'm not going to take a long time on this anyways, guys, so we're going to whip right through it, okay? <laughs> if you know where this stuff is that I'm referring to is in your book, have at it. I never even thought of that. I never even thought of that. Okay, so uh, in the first edition, big book, on the first forward to the first edition, it says on page X, I, 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 hang on a second. I should have just stayed in the Living Sober book. Has <laughs> <laughs> so everybody got the forward to the first in front of them? In the first paragraph, just look down. It says, the alcoholic is a very sick person. That's a, quite a pronouncement. Now, we're talking about why. Why trust God? If anybody's never seen this before, and I read you from... From the forward and the back. That, that thing in the forward and the back was something from Dr. Bob. This is the prescription that Dr. Bob wrote in the date is 1937. It's not that far along in, in, in the process of his own recovery. And he wrote that, he said, always, always remember it. Trust God, clean house, help others. Why would we need to trust God? Well, the alcoholic is a very sick person is a good reason. And the doctor's opinion uh, on XXIX, if you got a fourth edition, I apologize, I'm not sure where the other one is. I should probably get Kev up here. You can find it, no problem. Um, something more than human power? You know what that is? Faced with this problem, if the doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although he gives all that is in him, it is often not enough. I want you to think about doctors, therapists. I want you to think about treatment centers. I even want to think about your families. Often it's not enough. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. So now we know we're a very sick person. Now we know we need an entire psychic change. Now we know that it's essential. This psychic change is essential. It's very, very, it's, it's, it's not just a, a passing thing that's going to occur. And it's, it, we need this. It has to happen. This is the why. This is the why of it. Uh, then we get down to XXIX, same page. It says, um, once a psychic change has occurred, it's just above what I just read. Once a psychic change has occurred, all that's really necessary is that an inquiry that they follow a few simple rules. It's, it, 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 it's the first time that Bill sort of makes any sort of reference to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he refers to them as rules. Alcoholics don't like rules. I don't like rules. But he's calling them as long as they're able to follow a few simple rules. And he's talking about the program. He's talking about the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous there. They will, the only effort necessary to have this, this psychic change is if they follow a few simple rules. Now, if you don't accept the things that are laid out in this book wholly, you will always be around alcoholics and I was picking and choosing what works for you and doesn't work for you. For some strange reason, many years ago, I was open to the idea that this stuff was, was viable for me. It was viable in my life. As an alcoholic of this variety, this stuff all applies to me. There was no editing. I couldn't edit it. And I'm glad I didn't. More stuff has been revealed, but I'm glad I didn't. It goes on to talk about uh, how, the how, no, just a second, that's, I'm going to put that in the other thing. Um, on XXX, my book, it says most alcoholics are doomed, right? Most chronic alcoholics are doomed. That's a pretty good why. That's a pretty good why. We know we're powerless. You know, and I said to Kevin when we were talking about this stuff in the first presentation, there's a lot of emphasis on powerless. I was coming at it from steps 1, 2, 3, 4 through 9, and 10, 11, 12. That's how the approach was going to be. And I said, you know what? We talk about part If there's somebody new and it's, it's really important, being powerless is a wonderful, wonderful acknowledgement because it opens up a world of opportunities. But this is, we're already assuming that the people here are powerless. We're already assuming that people here have some understanding of their own personal powerlessness around alcohol. Whether you've had a step one experience or not is only, that's up to you. Only you know that. But if you're powerless, what is the natural, what is the natural sort of obligation or, or responsibility or thought that comes next? I need power. If I'm powerless, step one, I need power, step two. That's the acknowledgement. We're already moving into that place. We've only sort of rolled through some of the doctor's opinion stuff, and we're already moving into the place of, without power, I'm dead. With power, I can have an entire psychic change. We're still in the why. 
Right? And, 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 and I want to I just drive this stuff home. I want to go over and over and over again. So now we can get into the pages upon which we can all agree, uh, which is really important. If I go to page one in Bill's story, he makes a reference for I was hopeless. No. Is that page one? Page ten. Sorry. My ready. <laughs> so we go to page ten. See at the top there it says, I had to be, for I was hopeless. Is there anybody in this room who did not feel hopeless the day before they got sober? Um, I was just thinking about other related to Patty's, what she said. You know, we were talk- and I was thinking about something that happened this morning at church, and I was all elated with that. We don't, a lot of times, we're not able, we don't want to follow the rules, and we're not willing to look at the solution that us are completely down in the place where she said the girls are. So the, the thing is, if this is the only way, this power, this is the perfect time to bring in the power together. Because as we all know, working with people, we work with people who are sick and sad and, and they feel like crap all the time and they're not happy, yet they won't, they won't do the program. They won't do what we show them. And the thing is, is that they don't, and it's just like we bang our heads. Why? Why? Why won't they just listen? Why won't they do this? We're telling them how to do this. Why won't they do it? And it's because they're not desperate. Desper- Desperation is a powerful motivation. Desperate. And, and so many times when we were talking about Martin Luther King this morning, people were not willing to listen until they were at an absolute desperate point. So when we think about what, what she was saying, like that is the perfect time. That is the most vulnerable they'll be at. That is the best time to talk about God and power. Yeah, it is. And you know, and you have to be mindful of the fact that you're developing a relationship with people where they're watching. You know, they're wrapped up in themselves pretty good. But they are watching you. And if they see you solving your problems through spiritual means, they'll they'll be acclimatized to do that. But if they see you bumping your head and grinding stuff out all the time willfully, then they're gonna they're not gonna get what it is that you're talking about. And so by demonstration we have to be really strong in that regard as well. I want to say this at this juncture because the best material in all of Alcoholics Anonymous has already been stolen and said. Okay? And, and it just has. I mean we regurgitate stuff here sometimes, we get some laughs and walk away and think, I didn't even make that up. And I was not even lying. I stole that. But I want people to remember Chuck Chamberlain stuff. I want people to remember the Sandy stuff. I want people to remember the Chris S. stuff, the Dave P. stuff. We have one problem, and that's disconnection. And we have one solution, and that's a reconnection. One problem, one solution. It can be the children's aid. It can be the, uh, the parole being revoked. It can be, you know, no money. It can be, uh, I want a drink. I'm a, uh, one problem, one solution. If we got our head around that, if we really believe that, then that will always come ahead of any problems. That will always come ahead of any problems. And you will look in your own, if you're around alcohol, it's not five, six, eight, ten years. You look around in your own circles, in your own social circles, in your own recovery circles, and you will start to see stories of men and women who have survived calamity and difficulty that you may not feel that you might have been able to survive. And they did it with grace, and they did it with dignity. You know, and they did that with the power at the forefront. Same problems that I've been wrestling over. You know, same problems I've been, and we do do that. We'll hang on to something, we'll beat our heads to the wall, and one day we'll let it go and say, why didn't I do that three months ago? (laughs) That's the alcoholic way. That's the alcoholic way. What happens when you get sober, become sober, and you land in this place of of, uh, uh, the 10th step world, as I like to call it the 10th step world, is that that stuff doesn't stay with you that long. And the only difference between me and the nut job coming right out the street is the amount of time it takes me to repair it. That's the only difference. It's the same shit happens to him as happening. I got the same sensitive feelings and all that kind of stuff as the new, brand new guy. The only difference is, is I, I probably worry about it for less, longer of a time. I probably uh, annihilate myself a little less. I probably, you see what I'm saying? It's all in the degrees. It's all in the degrees. But it comes from the power. You know, my immediate, me, my immediate response to anything is usually wrong. Usually. And I live my life. I live my life. In, in, in trying to live in the world of the spirit, 
Yeah. Well, our reaction is typically, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's typically not the right way. We have to just work at that. It evolves, though. It evolves. Like, I, I, you know, some of us in here are professionals. Some of us actually have families that are still with us. Some of us, you know, we, we, we evolve. And the reason that people are still in our lives and we're able to hold down jobs when we couldn't before and all is because we're evolving. It's like, you know, we are evolving. And uh, there's a gentle, as much as I have a lot of edge and, and I've got a, a history and, and all, there's a gentleness to me that people see first now. There's a, an openness and a, and, a, and, a, and a camaraderie that people see first. That's not what they saw before. I mean, you get the feedback from people. You know, I used to be terrified of you. I hated your guts. And, and now I need your help. Well, my first reaction is like, yeah, really? They're coming up in my face and telling me you judge the shit out of me. Now you want my help? Get lost. Oh, no. Come here, come here, come here. But it's... Uh, you know, I, I'm really happy you put that proposition out there because that's the age-old question in Alcoholics Anonymous. Is anybody working with anybody? And ask ourselves. I don't know how many people have had problems today. How many people have had difficulties in their life today? It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. There's a number, good number of alcoholics in this room. I'm sure you beat the shit out of somebody today. I'm sure there's people in here have hurt somebody today. You know, there's people in here that have to, that have to make amends after this tonight. And I might be one of them, you know, so... <laughs> That's the way. We, it's the way we live. And if I if I say no, I will not do that. Then I bring suffering into my life. I close off the power. I do no longer trust God. So this is one I'll handle. Thanks. Thank you. you know? and, and 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 like I love how Sandy says it. And of all the people who should not believe that there's one solution for all problems, there's alcoholics. You know. All of a sudden I come to AA and they say, well, there's no. You know, you, you, know, you got no money. It's for anybody. Hmm. Well, no, I, I need money. No, you got no money. Say this for anybody. No, double up on your meat. Just don't put anything in the seven. No, um, go find somebody to help. I need practical solutions, dude. I need two G's. Like I don't need. <laughs> I need money. That's not how we see. It was, when we're wrapped up in self in the material world, that's how it looks. When I come and you old geezers there say say the serenity prayer. What you're saying to me is you put God in front of it and you're not going to worry about not having any money. And something will come. You put God in front of it. And this is the old coots I'm talking about that, that I thought were bone powder dry. Sitting in the back of the room saying this shit. And the fact of the matter is, is that I can be free of all things. One problem, one solution. That sounds a lot like drinking. Of all the people that should not miss that, it should be us. Driving home, problem with the relationship. I'm having a couple of drinks. You walk in, you say to your buddy, say, hey, the old lady, bitch, you know, and he says, hey, let me buy you a drink. Sure. You know, one problem, one solution. Walk in and go bankrupt, man. I'm losing my business. Hey, can I buy you a drink? Sure. I didn't need you to buy me a drink, actually. And so you start drinking. One problem, one solution. Nobody in this room should ever argue that that's a possibility. We come to Alcoholics Anonymous and we see that we can develop a relationship with a power that can remove all our problems. Oh, that's what the book says. We can solve all of our problems. The relationship with the power. My sponsor can't. My sponsor can't. But my sponsor can direct me to get a power that can solve all my problems. That's our job. It's our only job. I am a therapist. It's the bane of my existence in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's not because when I say it, because I'm a lousy therapist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. I said that on tape. <laughs> it's because it's like... <laughs> that's not what we do here we don't practice therapy we practice experiential sharing when one alcoholic shares with another alcoholic his experience, her experience something is apt to happen something quite amazing is apt to occur that's what happens in here it don't happen in my therapeutic life well, I had a guy in real quickly I quickly, quickly tried a story and, and I'll just sort of get through some more of this stuff you were right Kevin <laughs> um, Guy comes in, and we have a, some of you might have heard of the fast course, Stelco, a big steel companies in Hamilton. No? <laughs> major, major employer in our city. Our city has gone down to two because the U.S. Steel took them over. But, <clears throat> so they have a big EAP program, and, and I work for a private industry in Burlington and, and uh, as a cognitive therapist, and, and, but this one guy gets referred to me for uh, some addictions issues. And he comes walking into my office, and he says, now only, and like, I mean, therapists in Hannah, or normal therapist, or a good therapist, who handle this much differently. But he comes walking in the office, and he said, this is what happens. 
he says, uh, you know, he comes walking in and he sits down and he says, my wife's leaving me. Um, she's taking the kids. She tells me I'm not going to get to see my kids. Um, I'm, I'm on the brink of losing my job. I had to go to EAP. They're telling me if I don't get some help, they're going to fire me. Uh, these are some serious issues. They're very serious issues. And I said to the guy, well, tell me a little bit about this. This is the first session now. First session. So tell me about, and I, I've got up 22 sessions with this guy. Locked in. And he starts telling me about this. Said, well, you know, I just play hockey and hang with the boys and stuff like that. And he says, what happens is that I get off of work on a Thursday, I get my paycheck, and I go over to the galley pump, and the guy cashes a check there for me. I have a few beers, you know, I can't stop once I start. Uh, a couple of days pass, I show up back home, there's no food for the kids, there's no, you know, no clothes for the kids, the wife's pissed off at me, and he's going, now we're getting to some stuff here, right? A lot of therapists would tell that guy to go to AA. Sounds like you have a drinking problem, man, go to AA. I said to him, sounds like you might have a drinking problem. He said, next week, why don't we go home this way? He said, pardon? You get your check on Thursday, we'll go home this way. That man's life totally changed. It's called Brief Intervention Solution Focused Therapy. You just take the facts as they come, and you change them. And if it doesn't work, you figure something else out. If it doesn't work, you figure something else out. I'm 25 years in the business of therapy, and I've never made one referral to Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I don't meet us in, the, in therapy. I don't. I don't meet us in therapy. I meet us here, or in prison, or in hospitals. I don't meet us when you got 90 bucks to walk up and ask me to give you treatment for, 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 for a problem. You just don't. Why was I talking about that? I don't know why I was talking about that. Sponsor can feel power. You can, you know. Yeah, well, I'm not, so, yeah, and, and, and here I am sitting there full of this stuff, loving this stuff. You know, and this guy said, I can't stop once I start. But this guy never said he couldn't stop starting. He didn't qualify that way, which is a greater aspect of our disease because a lot of people can't stop when they start. They get in them, they like it, they keep going. We get in them, we can't stop. There's a difference. There's a difference. So this guy was on his way, and his life has changed exponentially. And I hear from him all the time. Good guy. A really good guy. The EAP person that referred him to me, she's an AA. She actually said to me, I don't know what you did with that guy. One session. Once I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. He came up with the plan. He designed the plan. He came up with it. He's not one of us. But he could easily have been sent here, which is one of the you know, pertinent to the, what I was talking about earlier. And he just sat at these tables, and he did not drink, and his wife would have got better and been a little bit happier and all that kind of stuff. So he just thought things were really going on. And somebody would have walked up to him and said, will you be my sponsor? And he would have said, sure, I'll be your sponsor. I'm four and a half years sober, man. And he said, well, what's these step things you're talking about? I don't know. I didn't do them, so let's just uh, go golfing. And uh, this guy then would have some problems in his life, and he'd, he'd end up getting all screwed up. And he'd say to his sponsor, but I'm going to meetings. And it'd get all confusing. And that's what we hear. That's the stuff we hear in AA today. People bringing that shit to the tables. That's what they discuss. That's what we hear. And that's a culmination of years and years and years of that stuff, of not qualifying people properly, sending the wrong people to Alcoholics Anonymous, because the first obligation you have when somebody comes in is making sure that they're one of us. Because your message that you're going to carry won't work on somebody who isn't. Why won't it work on somebody who isn't? Because they won't do what we need to do to get sold or stay sold. And, and, and the stuff in the, the, the world, the clamor, is the stuff that we can get past. It's over and over and over again. It's stuff that we want and we need and we think we want and need. We can get past that stuff with this, with God's help. So there's lots of reasons to trust God. Lots of reasons to trust God. Uh, I'm not going to say any more about that. I'm going to keep it that. I mean, I really have tons of more references for you, but I, you know what? I'm just going to say it. So the how of it is what? What do we talk about when we talk about the how? How do we trust God? Let me just find this here. I'll take it for five, ten minutes, and then we're taking a break, right? Ah, we know the story about Bill and Abby sitting at the table, right? You remember when Bill came and he thought his gym was going to outlast his ranting, and, and actually Abby did no ranting? I heard a little bit of a spin or a little bit different version of that. Uh, the book is very elegant in what it says. It says something like, uh, uh, Bill, it's sort of, Abby said I found religion, and Bill had started to shoot down, oh, here we go, y'all call it crackpot, you know, my gin will hold it a lot longer than your religious ranting, and he started mocking Abby. He really started mocking him. And the book says, my friend suggested then what seemed a novel idea. He said, well, why don't you choose your own conception? And that sounds really nice. We read that in meetings, we talk about that stuff. That's not what I heard happen. I heard he said, why don't you use your own goddamn conception of job, Bill? They were buddies. And wouldn't you say that? If somebody, you're sitting there trying to bring something to someone, you're slamming it back at you. And Eddie gave it to him with fervor. 
He gave it to him with fervor and said that. And that's why it struck home to Bill. He didn't strike a casual like this, choose your own conception. God, Bill would have an argument for that. Debbie gave him a hardcore. And that's why I say, like, you can't, we'll, we, we're very gentle here. And we have a powerful, powerful message that is loving and gentle. But it's not always a gentle way in which we need to deliver it. Sometimes we need to be firm. Would you say yesterday, Kevin, I'd rather step on your toes than step on your grave? Is that what you said yesterday? Isn't that... Like, I'd rather step on your toes than step on your grave. I'd rather hurt your feelings than, than, than watch you go and die or, or, or believe that this stuff doesn't work. You know? <clears throat> it goes on to say it's only a matter of what being willing to believe, right? Uh, page 13, he says... There, okay, now, so this is the how, okay? And I want people to play along with me here. <coughs> there I humbly offered myself to God. Anybody know what was that? What's that sound like? Is that three? To do with me as he would, I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing. What's that sound like? That without him I was lost. Sounds like step two, maybe? Only a power greater than I saw. I ruthlessly faced my sins and became willing to have my newfound friend take them away. Root and branch. What's that sound like? Six or seven? My schoolmate visited me. I had fully acquainted with him with my problems and deficiencies. What's that sound like? Step four. Step five. We made a list of people I had hurt and toward whom I had felt resentment. Step eight. Uh, the new God consciousness within, common sense would thus become uncommon sense. I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction, steps 10 and 11, as strength to meet my problems as he would have me. There's the how. Okay, there's the how in Bill's story. And, and the reason that, and when, we, when I was pulling this stuff together, I wanted people to understand that the how and the why of Alcoholics Anonymous is run throughout our book. I mean, I, again, I have, like, the, the why was, was quite lengthy. Why we're instructed that we should do this, trust God. And the how is this is the how. It meant self-destruction and self, self-centeredness. And we have a way to do that. Um, for if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life, so we have to perfect and enlarge our spiritual life. We have to begin to seek. It meant self, self, self-sacrifice self for others. We have to start putting others' needs ahead of our own. And if you were at the meeting I was talking about last night, part of it was that, but we were talking about thinking about others. It doesn't say that I'm going to help others. It says our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon some co- our constant thought of others because all we ever think about is us. And I owned the 97% yesterday. I said I was driving down here, 97% of the trip, I was thinking about me. And the other 3% was I was thinking about dying because of his driving. <laughs> We were in a blizzard, and uh, that was about me too. So it says if we don't if we don't do this, we can't survive with certain trials and the low spots ahead, which is a why. Okay. Uh, I want to go into the, the, the solution. I'm sorry. I have to, you said thinking of others, but but you also said when I'm not feeling right, we have to go help others. Yeah. So help me understand that. Yeah, that's well, that's and that's. I want, like, when I, when I actually was talking last night, you know, I gravitated towards helping others in my talk, right? Uh, because I was talking with my daughter, whom I was struggling with a great deal, and have been for a few years. And I know that she's one of the ones, she brings um, her own choice around drugs, and, 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 and her lifestyle brings a lot of pain and calamity to our, our life and our home. And I can walk in sometimes and, and uh, um, want to take charge. I want to control. I want to overpower because I see my wife's crying. She's shattered one more time. And I can't stand the pain. So I'll get a baseball bat and throw it in my trunk. And I'm sober. Stone cold sober. Absolute lunatic. And I drive downtown and I start chasing people around in the streets looking for my daughter. And that's not what the book says. <laughs> that is not what the book says. I'm thinking about me there. I can't stand seeing my wife cry. My daughter is driving me nuts. It's it's all about me. And I can justify that stuff to square, John. Oh, that's what I do, too. Oh, yeah, because he can. I can. You see? So it's the constant thought of others. If I turn my thoughts to others, in my prayers last night, I was very mindful of that because it was a topic. I didn't know what I was getting into last night. I didn't drive all the way down and think I'm going to talk about one line on page 20. I didn't even know what the format of the meeting was. 
It was what came to me while I was sitting there very quickly. And I thought to myself last night in my prayer, is I started to think of some other people that had talked to me about being afflicted with pain. And, I, and immediately I began to feel better. Immediately I began to feel this sense of ease and comfort. Like I would if I would taken a couple of drinks. The moment I turned my thoughts and my attention to other people, I immediately began to get this relief. Alcoholics are selfish and self-centeredness to the core. You know, people joke and say, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. You know, if you just go back in the last 24 hours, or the last conscious hours you've been awake, 7, 8 o'clock this morning, whatever, and think how much time have you divested in thinking about others. You know, you have this, like, you like this, you know, you got to circle here and do this. And I don't know if you can all see it, but there's others. Oh, there's me. <laughs> Others, me. And you know what's really sad? Sad, but wonderful too. So I actually have to make an effort. It doesn't come to me naturally. A lot of women seem to come to naturally where they're putting other people's needs ahead of their own. It doesn't come natural to me. I need something, someone, someone owned that in the meeting last night too. They said, I'll do something for somebody else, as long as there's something in for me. And I was pretty honest. But, that's the sort of that's that's the end. Helping others is, you know, we trust God, we clean house, we help others. The book talks about in the helping others why and how we have to do that, and that that's a different animal. Thinking of other people all the time is different than carrying the message and helping other people. Like I was saying, that uh, there's a mealy mouth little whining guy, and he can hear the tape. His name's Vinny. Uh, <laughs> This, guy, this guy's had 19, he's had 19 sponsors in a year. He's one of those guys, you know, and he's got, because of texting and stuff, three of his sponsors will be sitting in the same room getting texts at the same time about a new calamity. So I told him one time, I said, you know, buddy, I, I just can't stand this, man. You're going to die. You're going to die, and you have to do something about this. And he's crying and everything like that. And he said, well, what am I supposed to do? And we're talking about, like, we're going to talk about obedience here. Well, what am I, obedience to principles. He said, what am I supposed to do? I said, go down and scrape the corns off your granny's feet. He lives with his grandma. I said, go scrape the corns off your granny's feet. <laughs> That's how he reacted. He said, I'm not scraping the corns off my granny's feet. He said, well, shut up and don't call me. <laughs> if you're not obedient to spiritual principles, if you're not ready to do something, something, Something for somebody else. I got no business with this. I, ha- I can't listen to this one more time about how terrible your life is and your granny sitting downstairs and you're upstairs drinking like her liquor. You know, like go down and do something for her. And that's all I meant was go and do. So you could have done dishes. I didn't have to scrape a corn. <laughs> uh, let me just let me push right to one because. We go to page 25. I'm, I'm going to skip over a whole bunch of stuff here to get to, to the trust God. We go to page 25, and we look at there is a solution. Okay? So I have this powerless problem. I need to access power. I need to access that power somehow. And through desperate means and desperate measures, I'm compelled to, to open my mind to the fact that maybe there's a possibility there. And on none of us, like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, and the confession of our shortcomings, that's required for the successful consummation of this process. None of us like that. What is that? Self-searching, leveling of pride, confession of our shortcomings. What's that sound like? Step four and five? So we're not, you know, we're talking about spiritual principles in the steps. If you ask any old timer from the 60s back about what are the 12, or what are the spiritual principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, they'll say they're the 12 steps. They are one and the same to anybody who's been around here for a while. They are the 12 principles. The 12 steps. There's no, the 12 and 12 goes on to say that they embody spiritual principles, but any, you ask anybody who is around, they'll tell you that the 12 steps are the 12 principles. So we're moving towards a practice of spiritual principles in our life. They're going to relieve the obsession. We're going to do it through self-searching, the loving of pride, and, and confession of our shortcomings. And that's the how. And then on page 27, ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which are once the guiding forces of the lives of these men, are suddenly cast to one side. So whatever ideas, and this is an answer to your earlier question too, your earlier proposition, whatever ideas, you sir, well, listen, sure, whatever ideas, emotions, and attitudes you've got right now must be cast aside. They're the guiding forces of your life right now, and they can't be the guiding forces of your life. They need to be cast aside. And a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. 
Where do those conceptions and motives come from? The information that we're going to provide them. I don't know how you work with your person, but I'm going to get right into the third step, page 60 to 63. But then I'm going to get down on the knees and say, everything you pitched at these goddamn problems is causing you this pain and this agony. Are you ready to let this stuff go and try this stuff? Because if you're not, if, you, if you're postponing your third and fourth step, you're going to die. You're going to die behind it. You're going to die an emotional, painful death. And people don't want to be around you. They just won't want to be around you. You might not die physically, but you will die inside. And you'll wish that you were dead. So you need to take this. And these are actions that happen. And this is what I said earlier. This is rapid. This doesn't happen over 18 months. I wouldn't let anyone suffer for 18 months. I'd probably pull the plug myself. Like, I don't want people to suffer. I'll say, here's something that's going to help you right now. In a couple of weeks, you'll start to feel better. Oh, but the Children's Aid Society is taking my kids away. I got something here. If you do this in a couple of weeks, you're going to feel better. Oh, but my husband, he's, 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 he's taking me some, some support and stuff. If you do this, it'll help you feel better. Oh, and that's about it. One more. Oh, oh, then we're done. Okay, you need to get busy doing it your way. You need to get busy doing it your way. This is all we got. This is all we got. Try to sell somebody something else. They'll blame us for the, for the pain they experience. <laughs> Page 29. Referred to as clear-cut directions. Clear-cut directions. Okay, on page 29, clear-cut directions. And then I put a note here that I think that is very important. And we go right from there to the third step prayer. <laughs> what page is the third step prayer on? So he provides what we needed. Okay, I'm going to trust God now, okay? I'm getting sold on this idea why I need to trust God. But I need to know how to trust God. I need to know how. And we're going to take faith, and we're going to combine it with action. And we're going to see the results. And we're talking about days and weeks. We're not talking about a lifetime. We're talking about days and weeks. And it says, he provided what we needed. He could solve those problems around the children. He could solve those problems around the, the bad relationships. He could solve the problems of no financial security. He could solve these problems if I kept close to him and performed his work well. What is his work? What's his work? What's his work he wants for us? Hmm? Help others. We know this, okay? And then we go on to, we were reborn. We have that attitude, something's changed. I'm following directions. I'm obedient to the process. I've only been with this sponsor for a few weeks, and I'm obedient to the process. I'm already starting to feel differently. I'm starting to think that maybe, maybe, the circumstances haven't changed at all. In fact, they've gotten worse. But maybe I can get out from under this. This has owned me for a couple of years, and maybe I can get out from under this. You guys join me? Will you join me in the third step prayer? So many of us said, as we understood, God, I offer myself to thee, to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me in the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, the victory over them may be witness to the light of the help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. That is a commitment. That's a commitment to follow up with the rest of the steps. It's not that simple, but it's a commitment to follow up with the rest of the steps. When we look at that, we're asking for the relief of the bondage of self. Alcohol is not a problem today at this point. The obsession may still be on you. The, the desire to drink might still be there. But it's not a problem at this point. Your selfishness and self-centeredness is a huge issue. A huge problem. We're asking him to take it away. You take away my difficulties, the, ch the children's aid stuff and all that stuff, and I'll bear witness that it was you that did that. I will tell people, when I start feeling okay and settled about this stuff, I will tell people it was you that did that. When we confirm God in our lives to other people, God confirms his presence in our lives. It's that simple. It works both ways. And it's not, you can't just look at the good stuff that's happening in your life and say, well, thank you, Jesus, and thank you, God, or whatever it is. You've got to look at the bad stuff, too, and say, I'm growing. I'm growing here. This is all about growing. So that's what we get to. We get to that place. Now I want to go right to page 164. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. And 164. Okay. It just says, God will determine that. See what it says that? It says, you must remember that your real reliance is always upon him. It's not upon things human. It's not upon a, a successful relationship or a financial uh, uh, position of, of, of security. Your reliance is always upon him. 
I got to tell you, when you look into the eyes of someone who hasn't really got it going on, and like you see joy and stuff come alive, and you see stuff in the, inside of them, that they're okay. They're okay with the circumstances the way they are. I am enamored with that. I'm blown away by that. Um, and then it goes on to say, he'll show you how to, how to create the fellowship you crave. And uh, one more piece. Page 567, if I have it in my book. I think it's in the spiritual experience, isn't it? Yeah, is that different page too? Yeah, the spiritual experience. Try, uh, try the spiritual experience there. Mm-hmm. And you look at... Okay, page 567. It says, with few exceptions. You see that piece down the bottom? In spiritual experiences, says, with few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource. This is deep down inside each and every one of us. Unsuspected inner resource. You didn't know it was there. You didn't know it was there. It had never shown itself before. You can, you can rely on it. Like in Canada, we got these beautiful things called maple trees. And the way we get the beautiful, beautiful sweet syrup out of them is we drive a tap into the center of them. And slowly it trickles out. And it doesn't really amount to anything until there's substance there, until there's enough. And then if you just dip your finger and you taste it, it's sweet. It is beautiful, beautiful stuff. And so it says we tap this inner resource, and which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. You've started now just through the process of trusting God to develop an understanding that you're going to know more about this power, and more will be revealed to you as time goes on. But you live in that place, and you do this through certain practices and, and through the steps, 12 steps. It's the, the whole essence of the program is driven by the fact that you've come to rely on this power. You know, and even in the fourth step, it says, when you're talking about fear and you're inventorying your fear, it says, we haven't, we, we've come to rely on this power. We, we trust God now. We think that this is a much better way in dealing with these fears. We've come to rely and trust on this power. And that's what's happened by step four. So, are we going to just take a quick break? It'll take like, uh, I don't know how much time. Huh? Are you done? I'm done that first, yeah. I'm done the first verse. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.